Hey there, everybody out in podcast land. This is Susan Mogensen with Policy G. Take it from me. Rob is off today, so we're just going to be talking to you one-on-one. The topic today is hierarchy. I want to talk about the meaning of hierarchy and governance and how policy governance works with all of that. And I also want to share some tips with you on having good conversations around the board table. We'll leave that towards the end. And by the way, just want to take a quick moment to mention that if you would like to send us any questions to talk about on a future podcast, or if you just want to make a comment, feel free to use the voicemail function for this podcast. Send us your thoughts and we'll be happy to include them in a future podcast. The link for sending us a voicemail can be found on the Anchor podcast platform, as well as on the Apple platform, I believe. Uh, You can also go to our website and choose the podcast tab, and you'll see all the different places where you can find this podcast, including YouTube, where you can also type a comment, of course, and uh, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. So hierarchy. I did a lot of thinking on this topic several years ago when somebody posted in one of those nonprofit discussion forums a question about, does anybody know about a non-hierarchical model of governance or governance structure? And um, it prompted me to write a couple essays or pieces for board leadership The first of two parts is called The Ups and Downs of Hierarchy, How Policy Governance Resolves the Common Complaints. And the second one was titled Hierarchy Necessary, but Not Necessarily Evil. Her question really sort of puzzled me because it felt like somebody who was asking, how do we invent, you know, an apple that's not a fruit or a banana that's not a fruit? because the nature of governance itself has hierarchy built into it. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just has to do with the order of authority. You know how in previous podcasts, we've talked about person A and person B. And person A is the one who has the resources and the instructions and the expectations they give them to person B, who then is accountable or responsible for carrying it out. And then they report back what they did back to person A. So there's that flow of kind of delegation and authority to someone who's then empowered to complete something or do something. And then they turn back the results to person A. So there's that A, B thing. And it's always important to remember that person A has some kind of acknowledged authority that they can use in order to give those instructions. And person B has basically by taking over that job or agreeing to carry out the instruction or direction has provided their agreement, their, their assent to do what they have been asked. So when you really like zoom in on that, what I call accountability or responsibility channel, between two people or two bodies, it's very clear that they have kind of different roles in that moment. That person A has the authority to require that something get done and person B is empowered to do it and agrees to do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in that position of being position B. Um, If somebody didn't like that position, they wouldn't agree and they couldn't be held accountable for anything because they wouldn't even be in that job, right? So governance talks about all of those relationships that people have between each other and groups of people have between each other in organizations. And where policy governance comes along is it says that um, there are different types of authorities that are sort of giving instructions and receiving results back and forth. And usually you don't really think about it or look at it really, really up close every time uh, until something goes wrong. Um, Just like if there's some sort of plumbing issue in your house, um, a, a plumber 
will have to zero in and find out where the problem lies and fix it. Same in organizations. If there is some kind of blockage or disconnect, you kind of have to go in and, and, and trace where the, where the sort of the block or the disconnect in the system is happening and fix it. So when we're talking about those relationships in organizations and governance generally, it's helpful to kind of think of the different types of people or types of roles that are being played. Uh, in policy governance, we talk about this concept of ownership, where the, there are these people, whether in the nonprofit sense, often they are, you know, members or citizens or people sharing a passion for something. They kind of have not a financial ownership, but a, what we call a moral ownership. That group of people we see as being at the very top of an organization. So if you typically think of a hierarchy as being like um, a triangle with the pointy end of the triangle at the top, and then it spreads out to the, to the longer base at the bottom, we don't see organizations that way. We don't see that there's a singular person at the top who then is king of the castle and tells everybody what to do. That's not the kind of hierarchy we envision, but rather it's about the flow of authority um, between these different uh, people or groups of people. For example, if we start with the owners, they are usually the broadest group of people um, that we talk about. And they have the, the, the initiating authority in an organization. So everything starts and ends basically with who those owners are, whether they're uh, legal, moral, legal or moral owners, um, whether they're financial owners or they're sort of owners of a, a social return on investment. So that large group of people, they are the, they are the keepers, the holders of the kind of initiating authority. And um, so everything, when you talk about uh, hierarchy and governance, that hierarchy is established immediately when we acknowledge that these people, uh, the legal or moral owners, are the sort of the, the top, at the very top, they're the, the king of the castle that group of people, usually it's a group of people. You could have an organization or company that's owned by one person, and then they have that ownership kind of position. But in most cases, the, the largest group of people, perhaps aside from the customers or beneficiaries, um, the largest group of people sort of within the organization is this sort of ownership class, if you will. So they are the initial authority. And then Usually, because it's not practical for all of them to sit around a board table and, you know, make decisions or, you know, um, sort of monitor the organization. It's not really practical. Um, you have a directing authority, and that's our board of directors or board of trustees or our legislative body. So as soon as you've established that, that there is an initial authority like the owners, and then they uh, can't do everything, so they delegate to a board to direct and protect the organization. Um, immediately with that, and if we didn't go any further, we've established a hierarchy that the ownership interest comes first and the directing interest comes second. Then if you subsequently have someone in a chief operating position like the a CEO or an executive director, that person then has kind of an, an execution authority or an implementation authority. They're the ones who have been given the authority by the directing authority to uh, make sure that stuff happens. And then if, if there are additional people in the organization, they may have, you know, management authority, operational authority, and so on. But even if you just had an ownership and the board, and even if the ownership and the board were the exact same people, which is possible, say you had a, a small company, it has a board of directors of five people, and its ownership are the same five people, 
uh, the the sort of the hierarchy is even established there uh, within the the two different or or more uh, roles or hats that those two groups that those those people are are playing. So the five people as owners have ownership authority, and then they might also have directing authority if they're also the the board of directors. And then those same five people actually because policy governance doesn't require, doesn't have any principles requiring organizations to have a singular operational authority like a CEO, those five peop- same five people could also be like a management team that carries out um, the work or the operations of the organization. So you could have that same group of people who are playing all of those different roles, but in each role, they are fulfilling kind of a different interest or a different sort of level of authority in the hierarchy. So anyway, uh, John Carver says it well. He's got an article in Board Leadership as well. It's in his On Board Leadership book where um, what he says is some people have difficulty with what they perceive to be the hierarchical nature of the policy governance model. And we'll get to that in a sec. The board is clearly dominant. The CEO is not an equal partner with the board. The staff is not an equal partner with the CEO. Such hierarchy is not only off-putting to them, but also borders on being regressive, rigid, militaristic, and for some, anti-feminist. These critics often speak of the partnership of board and staff as if there were no differences in authority. So we're going to talk a little bit more in a bit about how policy governance principles work actually to mitigate uh, the most common complaints people actually have with hierarchy in organizations and show you how, actually, if you are concerned about hierarchy in the sense that I just mentioned, or in the sense that this person um, had been uh, asking or talking about several years ago when I wrote these board leadership articles, if you have many of those uh, complaints or concerns with hierarchical organizations, then policy governance could really be your best friend, as a matter of fact. So we'll talk about that in a sec, but just leave that there for now. We'll go to a quick break and come right back. You want to make the world a better place, but how? So much to do, so little time. Well, serving on a board of directors is a great way to help create a better world, especially if that board has a clear system for achieving results. Learning how to be an effective board member used to mean reading big books and going to expensive workshops. But now there's engaging online training. The Board Accelerator is a web-based governance course that lets you learn at your own pace and place. Whether you're considering joining a board or serving on one now, the Board Accelerator gives you key insights and the confidence to be an effective board member. To learn more, visit browndollconsulting.com and click book a call. Talk soon. Talking about hierarchy here on Policy G, take it from me. So let's think about the concept of hierarchy and what comes to mind when you say, oh, our organization is so hierarchical or the problem has to do with the hierarchy of the organization. What are people really concerned about? What are they really talking about when they say that? So first off, I'm thinking it's this idea of top down, that there is authority at the top and it is telling everybody at the bottom what to do. So it's kind of a top down structure. With the policy governance principles, we also, I mean, the pictures that I often draw are of like an Um, upside down triangle on top of a triangle. So like an hourglass kind of drawing or diagram. It's actually frequently used to show the roles and relationships between people in organizations. And so we say, yeah, it is top down, but the top is the people. It's the citizens. It's the owners. 
whether it's the shareholders, it's the members. So that ownership principle for us in policy governance, we say, yeah, it's top down and the top is the people. It's not one singular person. So in that sense, um, we think, you know, hierarchy is good because it's that broad group of people, owners, whatever you want to call them, they come first. They have the initiating authority, right? So we don't associate that. We don't consider that a negative. We think that's a positive, usually, you know, power to the people. Often it's typically uh, thought of as the grassroots, right? And that conjures up an image of people um, being at the bottom, like the grass, <laughs> the roots of the grass, I guess. Um, I depict it more as the people are at the top and uh, sometimes jokingly say that the uh, raindrops of authority flow down from the people to the board, to the CEO, to the staff. So the top-down thing doesn't really bother us too much because it's the people who are at the top, and that's a good thing as far as we're concerned. A second thing that people associate with hierarchy is, and it also comes into play with the top-down idea, is the feeling that there are many levels or layers within the organization and they block you from getting things done because each layer or level has to get approval, remember that, approval from the level above them in order to do something. And I really, really sympathize with that problem. I once had a job I'm not going to say which one it was, but I once had a job where I felt like I could not actually do anything because the level above me just kept blocking me. It was a super frustrating feeling because you always wanted to get something done and you couldn't because, you know, it had to have the okay, the say so from the person in the position above me. And uh, I never knew, well, is that person like sharing my idea with the person above them? Why am, do I keep getting blocked? Because I'm the kind of person I like to come up with ideas and be creative and take initiative. And I just kept getting blocked. So I really, really sympathize with people who are in jobs where they feel like they can't get anything done or they don't have the tools to do what they need to do in their jobs because the people at the next level up are blocking them. So now if you've been listening to this podcast, you will know that um, we've previously talked about this mother may I approach and how policy governance resolves that, that instead of having this mentality of for everything you want to do, you know, create your plan, create your budget, and then take it up to the next level for approval, at least with respect to the person at the top of the operational side of the organization and the board, we have kind of eradicated that, that pattern. And instead, we've asked boards to clearly establish the criteria that the CEO or executive director has to fulfill. And then, so the CEO and all their staff, they don't have to keep asking the board for approval for everything because they already know what the criteria are for approvable decisions. And I'll tell you, I've had other jobs where that was in effect, where I had enormous creative freedom. I knew what my boundaries were. I knew what resources were available. I knew what had to be achieved and I could just go to town. And I was never happier in a job than when I had that, when I had clear kind of executive limitations, if you will, and criteria, essentially, for what needed to be achieved. And it was great because I could just like get things done and get them done really, really well and save money and produce a good result. And it was just like very, very happy making to have that rather than the kind of mother may I approach where you do a, a ton of work and then you're crossing your fingers hoping they approve it and then maybe they do maybe they don't and it's never really you know predictable so that issue that's associated with hierarchy where people feel like they can't get things done because there's so many levels of approval policy governance at least between the principles, you know, apply between the CEO and the board, at least at that stage, 
you don't have that problem. And we once had someone from Heineken Beer from the Netherlands come and do a presentation at the International Policy Governance Association. And he did this whole presentation on how he used policy governance principles at Heineken at the management level. So those same ideas of creating boundaries and clear criteria for what needed to be achieved, he talked to us about how he used those concepts and principles at the management level so that everybody at that level and and all the staff could get things done very quickly. And he told us stories about how initially he was frustrated because there were always so many meetings and meetings and meetings and long meetings where everyone had to go over every detail in order to figure out what to do. And then when he put these principles in play, sort of cascading policy governance principles all throughout the management structure of the organization, everyone was able to get so much more done so much more quickly. And it really helped to eliminate that feeling of being blocked all the time because you have to, you know, ask for approval or have another meeting and so on. I also recall seeing a news story several years ago of the reasons why older people, um, I think it was especially baby boomers, were leaving their jobs. And the number one complaint they had was that they didn't feel like they had enough autonomy in their job position. That being micromanaged or being told what to do or being blocked from doing what they wanted to do was a really serious problem for them. And it just made them want to up and quit. So I totally get that. And um, in organizations where those levels are really, really kind of strict and you you have delays and this whole mother may I thing, I can totally understand why the the way in which hierarchy kind of lives in those organizations is real is a real downer. And so uh, policy governance principles, if you use them, like the uh, person who spoke to us from from Heineken used them, you could uh, really go a long way towards resolving one of those sort of standard hierarchical complaints. Another common complaint associated with hierarchy is when individual board members think that they have individual power to direct staff. And that can be a very common hierarchical complaint where staff are constantly getting all these different directions and instructions from individual board members. We already know from previous podcasts that board authority is group authority. And so having individual directors kind of throw their weight around at the staff level is not a thing with us in policy governance. The board as a whole has to make the decision. And then that decision then is the one that gets acted upon either by the staff or a board committee or board officer. Another hierarchical complaint is when more frequently seen at, in the management and uh, staff levels in big organizations where just individual managers or the CEO uh, treat people badly. You know, they're on a power trip or they, they're telling people what to do and they're bullying staff and so on. And so while policy governance principles don't tell anybody what their policies exactly should say, there is the mechanism in there for executive limitations. So if the board is concerned about anybody bullying or harassing staff, what they typically do is they put into effect a a treatment of staff policy where they say don't do anything unfair or disrespectful or don't harass staff and so on. And then, of course, that is backed up by the monitoring system to make sure that it's not just words on a, on a policy page, that they're, they're actually enacted. And so uh, that problem can be definitely mitigated big time using uh, policy governance uh, principles, using the standard, some of the standard policies that uh, boards using policy governance will use. One more problem that is associated with hierarchy in organizations is the tendency to have people operating in silos, in information silos, where they don't know what's going on in another part of the organization, or the communication flow is blocked. Again, with the use of 
the policy governance principles in particular, having a really good, robust set of policies that everybody understands and, and policies that are used, like the ENDS policies, for example, is a biggie. It really, really helps to ensure that everybody knows where they fit in the whole scheme of things. You know, and people have different jobs. Like if you have, say, five people and they're just, all they're doing is they're working together around a table to complete a puzzle, then every single person in that group can contribute equally. You know, they can all kind of look for the pieces to figure out where they go and they can work all together as a team and have a good time doing it. But as soon as you get into any endeavor that's more complicated than that, where people need to have different roles, then there has to be some sort of way of figuring out who's being delegated to to do what and what each role entails. And policy governance uh, helps us accomplish that by making the policies very clear from the board level. And then the monitoring system helps to make all of that clear for the rest of the people who are working within the organization. It's funny how like when you have a team in a sports team, it's very well understood and natural that everybody has a different role, um, but they all come together to achieve the same objective. And then everyone has a different role within that. Similarly, in organizations, people have different roles. It doesn't mean somebody is better than another person. It's just that everybody has a different role. And then when you can see the big picture, especially the ends, if everyone can see what they're all working towards, that really helps to build collaboration, cooperation, communication, all that good stuff, and helps everybody see the part they play in the big picture. I think those are kind of the main issues or troubles that come to mind when people say uh, they don't like hierarchical organizations. And really, if you're using policy governance, you can mitigate all of those problems to a huge extent. You get rid of the mother may I approach. You get rid of a singular board member throwing their weight around. You make the direction of the organization crystal clear. You have a monitoring system to show how well you're achieving the results. All of that comes together, in my mind, to um, eliminate many of the standard complaints people have with hierarchy. So if you're more interested in that topic, I've, these two articles in board leadership really kind of spell it all out in you know sort of good detail and I give examples and so on. So that's worth looking up if you uh, want to uh, read more about that in more detail. So we're going to take another quick break and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about collaboration and communication around the board table. Hey, have you ever wanted to make a quick comment, ask a question or signal something during a meeting without interrupting the person speaking? Reading body language and keeping people engaged is hard enough at the best of times. That's why we design Meeting Helpers, a visual tool for communicating without interrupting. Each set of Meeting Helpers lets you applaud someone's idea, let people know they're getting off track, point out a process issue, and much more. Visit browndogconsulting.com to get copies of the original Meeting Helpers for your board or team today. And we're back. So let's look at what boards can do. A few practical tips for boards, especially boards that are concerned about any negative effects of kind of a hierarchical uh, mindset, one that's about, you know, related to the negative side of hierarchy and not the order of authority that I was talking about earlier. So one thing is, I remember once I went to this conference in Chicago, it was an ethics and compliance conference. And it was after all the world calm meltdown stuff and Ron, and they were all talking about Sarbanes-Oxley, the legislation in the States that was supposed to improve accountability systems and corporations. They were talking a lot about that and about the importance of setting the tone at the top, setting the tone at the top. They kept talking about that. And I thought, wow, these guys must all be on board with policy governance. But then when I asked them about that, very few of them knew anything about what policy governance was. But they latched on to this phrase of setting the tone at the top. 
And I think in most cases, that tone at the top that they were talking about had to do with people in the C-suite people, the CEOs and CFOs and all of that. So they didn't really have a sense of policy governance. But I thought, well, yeah, um, when you think of organizations, first of all, the top is the people or the shareholders, the citizens, whoever the legal moral owners are, that they could, in fact, set, set a tone But they don't have the chance really to get together and sort of share their values and ideas too much. So really, it's the board of directors that's got the next best chance to set the tone at the top, as it were. And so in doing so, boards need to realize that what they do and how they run their board meetings and how they operate and how they carry out their functions really does have an impact on the rest of the organization. So if you want to have a collaborative culture and one where people are good at trusting and respecting each other and communicating well, the board obviously has to be a model for everyone else. They have to do that really well. If that push is not coming directly from the owners, well, at least the board can do a good job of communicating with each other. And so this is where I always kick in and say, hey, policy governance is is basically a start. That's your foundation for how, you know, organizations should operate. We need to add on to that the whole field of facilitation and and good decision-making techniques. And that's that's a a perfectly natural sort of plug-in to the policy governance system. So if boards can model good collaboration communication by using people in the facilitation field or using facilitation techniques in order to have really thorough, good policy discussions and, and allow board members to make the best possible decisions and to hear each other and all of that stuff that we associate with a cooperative, collaborative organization then by all means use the services of facilitators or like I'm not saying me necessarily, but the services of professional facilitators out there or their techniques, because that is going to go a really, really long way towards improving uh, communication, collaboration, et cetera. So that's tip number one. And I've talked about that before and I'll probably talk about it again because I feel like it's a really important piece of this whole puzzle of organizations. So knowing that boards do set a tone, do influence the culture of the organization, then if you want to have that kind of very uh, collaborative organization, then the board's got to do it itself and figure that out. Another suggestion I always have for boards is figuring out what your board members are good at. What are the things that your individual directors enjoy? And what skills do they bring to the table? Because the more people can sort of feel empowered to do the thing that they're really good at around the board table, the better it's all going to work. So if you know that somebody is really good at, I don't know, researching or or doing sort of detailed analysis work, then let them do that in a a targeted way that helps the board with its overall functions. Again, if you have good communicators or good people who are uh, understand marketing and communications, they might be great on your ownership linkage team. And if you have other people who are very like lawyers or people who are rule, (laughs) rule followers, um, they might be especially good at, Uh, tweaking policy language or suggesting different policy options and so on. So always kind of using your board authority as group authority for sure, but it also helps everybody work better together when they know what kind of role they can play on the board team that's going to further everyone's objectives Uh, the board's objectives and the organization's objectives that much better and and faster. And lastly, I wanted to mention the, the yes and technique. Now, this is a good one, whether you're in a board meeting or you're just talking to a family member or a friend and you are trying to 
do the thing they say about disagreeing without being disagreeable. I learned this technique from Izzy Gazelle. He's an improv expert and has all kinds of great ideas and tools in the facilitation field. I went to one of his workshops and he had us practice this yes and technique for disagreeing with each other. And if you haven't heard of it, the technique is to listen to somebody's opinion. So somebody says, I don't know, I really like asparagus. And if you want to kind of engage in dialogue with that person, you start off by saying yes, and then you kind of repeat or sort of paraphrase what they've just said. So yes, I understand you really like asparagus. And then you insert and, and then you add your own kind of connection to that statement. So yes, you enjoy asparagus and I find it hard to choke it down unless it's crispy and I don't know, (laughs) tastes like garlic and cheese. Or someone might say, I disagree with the government's position on this particular issue. And so you say, yes, I understand you have strong feelings about that particular issue. And, and then you show like your side, what you are seeing, what your perspective is. So the technique, I think it it works really well. If you, if you try this around the board table, you start with one person, they state an opinion and then the net they the next person does the yes and technique and then the next person builds on it you can sort of go all the way around the board table or around the zoom room with using that technique to get out everybody's opinions in a way that is uh less confrontational and more kind of open more of an open dialogue it's uh it's interesting how it works and and it's 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 all about not falling into the yes, but inclination. Yes, but yes, but yes, but we're so quick to want to say what our point of view is that we sort of disregard what they say, don't listen to it, and then uh, push back against it. And that creates more conflict and less of a, I don't know, a dialogue that builds on different people's perspectives and ideas. So I just always remembered that from Izzy Gazelle's uh, workshop and just thought, yeah, that I got to keep remembering to use the yes and technique because it's a way to try and open doors and keep information and communication flowing rather than shutting people down. So that might be a useful tool for both the board in its own deliberations when the board is speaking with its owners or um, uh, amongst the staff. Uh, or between the CEO and uh, people on the staff side. So that's it for today and this episode number six of Policy G, Take It From Me. I really look forward to receiving your comments and questions. We look forward to coming back again next week with more topics and more inspiration and more tips for everybody, all of you out there in board governance land. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. Please share this podcast with your friends, colleagues, and fellow board and staff members. For the show notes, choose the podcast tab at browndogconsulting.com. This episode was produced by Brown Dog Consulting, hosted by Susan Mogensen and Rob Ludlow, and edited by Sandra Mogensen. Bye for now. Thank you.